Hey y'all, it's me, Zach. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm the youth direct. I'm the director of youth outreach for the Future Perfect Project. I'm really excited to be here tonight with you. Hi, James. Hi, Celeste. Um, I am here uh, preparing for our guest, Alok, who is an amazing writer, poet, activist, who is coming to have a conversation with us about being queer, about being an artist, um, and to talk a little bit about our workshops that are coming up. So, oh, hey, Alok. Oh. A locus at the request. It's time. Oh, here we go. Hi. Here they are. How are you, Alok? I'm great. How are you? I'm so happy to be with you. I've yeah. heard the most amazing things about you from everyone. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, not just about how beautiful you are as a human, as the way you interact in the world, but also just your beautiful soul. Thank and I'm you. so excited that you're with us today. Um, happy to be here. Yeah, I was just saying, my name is Zach. Well, my name is Z. My given name was Zach. Um, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm the director of Youth Outreach for the Future Perfect Project, which is an organization that believes that the self-expression of LGBTQ plus teens and allies is a declaration of a better future for us all. And so the Future Perfect Project FPP Live interviews are our weekly series where we interview an amazing human being like Alok. Um, and we have many other programs coming up this fall that I'll talk to you a little bit about the end. Um, but we have writers workshops, we have special guest artists, we, uh, which Alok has been with us before. And we're gonna talk a little bit about um, your writing, your workshops that you participated in. I actually got to watch um, the workshop that you did on transformation, oh my, God, girl, you are like, you know how to really bring out um, these young people's voices. And um, I just think you celebrate, or my experience of you thus far has been a celebration of community. And I sort of want to begin there. Um, you have this really beautiful quote in Beyond the Binary. I matched today with your book. I did it purposefully. <laughs> Thank you. Um, where you say, oh, of course, <laughs> it's my pleasure. Um, where you say, there is magic in being seen by people who understand. It gives you permission to keep going. Um, and I know you grew up in College Station, Texas. And I'm wondering what, like, what that transformation from your youth growing up in a traditional Indian um, community in Texas, small community as you describe in the book, um, and what it's been like to find the community and family of queer people um, that you claim today. Yeah, you know, it saved my life, truly. Um... It's, you know, it's a really interesting time to be a writer because what we're seeing happen across the world is people are saying, how could this be happening? Things are so surreal. This feels like fiction. And I'm like, yeah, it is fiction. Because one of the fictions uh, in this country is individualism, where people are taught that uh, it's about the cult of personality, like individual resilience and strength. But I'm a testament to the fact of my community. Like I only can exist as confidently as I do and as articulately as I do because of my amazing queer and trans community. And I think that I mistakenly um, was led to believe that my family of origin was the only family. But actually when I found my queer and trans family, I received the kind of love that family should be about. I think that chosen family is different often than family of origin because family of origin is often about indoctrination, whereas chosen family is actually about invitation. Invitation to your best self, invitation to learning and growing and being more compassionate. And so, you know, I think when people always ask me, like, how did you accomplish this or what did you do? I'm like, it's just a testament to how amazing my friends are. Like, they've changed my life. That's so, uh, so profound and I can really identify with that. I grew up in a traditional Latinx uh, Catholic family and it's been so interesting to, um, to read your work and see how you um, speak about your experience with, with community and faith. And um, something you said so brilliantly in the workshop is you talked about um, the ability to communicate with people in a way that um, meets the world meets the world that they're in um particularly people who are cis or um uh heterosexual but like they um have the people who identify in that way are in a 
in their own way, um, casting their gaze on us as queer people. You talk a lot about the violence of, of seeing, right? And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you could talk to us about what that experience was like for you as a teen and how you think that relates to young people today. Yeah, I mistook their insecurity for themselves as my own insecurity. That mm -hmm. I mistook the way that they saw me as the way that I see myself. And I think my definition of transition is actually about reclaiming my image from other people's gaze to my own inward gaze. Being able to have a relationship with myself unmediated by other people. And I think that that is so threatening to this world that makes you the summation of what you're seeing. But I'm not interested in being in that world, you know? <laughs> That's a world that leads to like climate doom and like global pandemics and insecurity and loneliness. I'm interested in being in another world where people actually are committed spiritually to having an identity outside of a uniform. And so I think that, you know, one of the frustrations that I have is that the political language that we've inherited says LGBTQ rights, but is it us that needs to be empowered? Because I actually think that we're liberated. I think that being queer and trans liberated me from a life of misery, from a life of homogeneity, from a life of apocalyptic loneliness, from a life where I, where I was taught that the only way I could get access to care and intimacy was through marriage and not through my friendships. <laughs> ah! So I'm liberated. So I, I don't know if the issue at hand is, you know, needing to empower LGBTQ people as much as it is needing to give permission to LGBTQ people to be the power that they already were before they had to forget it because they internalized what cis straight people taught them they should be. And that feels like a different agenda to me. Yeah, healing. You 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 discuss a lot of, about healing in work in our workshops and in your writing, and you said um, you said something so beautifully. Um, you said, "I emancipated myself from the binary through my healing," and I'm I I was listening to it as I was doing some chores, and I was like, "Oh my God, I have I have this power." within myself. And I love that you say that, that we don't necessarily need to empower queer people. It's about how we are engaging um, with each other in space to, to build that community, to build that communion. Um, I'm wondering, you talk about alchemy as well. And I'm wondering if you could talk to a little bit about how that relates to this magic that you speak so passionately about. Because I love that, um, I love how often in your writing and in your workshops and in, in in the way that you just um, interact with, with colleagues that I know who love you and you talk about magic. And I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if you were in high school right now, like what kind of magic would you be creating? I mean, there's so much magic. <laughs> yeah. I think I created magic when I was in high school because I survived. And mm -hmm. I think the issue is that we've made magic something that evolved, is in like in a fantasy world. But actually magic for me is what allowed us to endure, survive, triumph, overcome in this world. And so my magic was, I was like, okay, I'm in this like extremely conservative, extremely religious, extremely racist town. If I, if I live my life, I'm gonna be in danger. So I'm gonna find a way to find community digitally. And so I, I was out on MySpace girl. <laughs> screen time thing just popped up when I was talking about finding community digitally because <laughs> it's just a <laughs> testament to the fact that I'm online all the time. But I was like, okay, I'm not going to be getting um, my community in person. So how do I materialize that? And so from the age of 13, I was online finding other LGBTQ artists who were like, oh, what you have to say is important. And no one in my life was saying that. That is the magic of queer and trans young people that often doesn't get discussed because the only framework that this society has is that they're woefully being oppressed, but also amidst that oppression, they're enduring, surviving, and creating. And if we are not as fluent in that as we are in 
the violence that we're experiencing, then what are we doing, you know? And I think it's so often the only way that we've gotten attention from straight society is by saying, these are all the horrible things that happened to me. But also, we should be able to say, here's all the miraculous things that I did, because every trans person is a miracle in a world structured by the gender binary that disappears us from history. For us to be here right now is, is a testament to our magic, right? So I begin from that. But then I think what I mean when I say alchemy is it's about transformation, meaning who I was 10 years ago, let alone 10 months ago, let alone 10 days ago, was a fundamentally different person than who I am now. And one of the myths, once again, the Western fictions, is that we have a fixed self from when we're born until when we die. And I'm like, oh, it's unambitious. I am transforming every microsecond and I am embracing my transformations. And that's what differentiates, I think, queer and trans people from straight to society is we are embracing our transformations and we are seeing that motion not as volatility, but as joyous. Why would we want to be stopped? Ah! change is actually an eternal rhythm to the universe everything is transforming and it's so funny how they will say well you transform your gender and it's like look at the seasons darling you know it's like look at the sun darling everything else is moving but you so am i the issue or is your stagnancy the issue and so alchemy is actually what i mean when i'm saying embracing the transformation of matter to actually become that which we were always meant to be. And I, I'm not there yet. I'm aspiring. I'm moving towards maybe one day, but I'm also not interested in the destination. I'm interested in the journey. So I think part of the magic also is about rejecting that there's a X on a map and more being like, I'd rather just stroll and watch. You know, I really am frustrated by how the right wing uses this word nature, you know, they're saying, it's just not natural, queer and trans people, you're against nature. And I'm like, well, I guess we're experiencing different natures. Because last time I checked, if you look at any animal kingdom, any plant kingdom, diversity is the strength of an ecosystem. Ecology is a basic lesson that variation is about survival. So how can you use nature to keep me still when actually nature should be that which says change like the earth does? Yes. Yes. What I'm identifying. I lost you. <laughs> that was the universe. That was the universe doing some crazy stuff with us just now. Um, you, it's funny. On one of the works in the workshop I was watching, you actually acknowledged um, a notification that happened in the moment. Um, and it's so real. I love how present you are. And um, you talk a lot about, uh, I want to acknowledge the journey, right? That like, we are all on this ride. And thankfully, we have each other in this queer community to be on that ride with. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little to your experience with the Future Perfect Project workshops, what your experience was with those, those teens in particular? What did you see uh, come from day one to day two? Or what, how did you see them come, come out, so to speak, uh, within that time? I operate from the premise that everyone in the world is a genius, which I think is just very different than what we're taught in this culture of hierarchy. I just think that people haven't been given permission to be a genius because we live in a culture that invalidates people, tells them that there's not enough. And so the way that I teach is I say, I am ready to receive your genius. And I, I think there are very few people who taught me in that way. People said, here is how you should be smart rather than show me how you're intelligent. And when I'm saying genius, I don't just mean the ability to take an SAT exam. There's so many forms of genius and there's emotional genius and creative genius. And so what I witnessed in, in working with the Future Perfect Project and LGBTQ young people in the group, but also across the world, is that the travesty is that young people are never asked to demonstrate their genius. Instead, they're asked to like study 17 hours for an exam to memorize 
20 things they're not even gonna remember in two weeks. That's not education. I don't remember anything that I learned back in grade school. Oh my God, I was wasting my time and I had no one, I had no one say, turn in a poem instead, if that's what, if that's what you wanna do. I had no one say, paint a portrait if that's what you need to do, you know? And so what I exist as a teacher is not to impart new knowledge, but actually to allow people to show their genius. And the way that we workshop, it's once people show their genius, they see this thing and then they're like, oh, that was in me. That gives me conviction that I can actually do even better. And that's what changes people, not criticism. Ah! We live in this weird culture that thinks that if you like shame people or like insult people, or just like bully them, they somehow grow. That's just not true. That's how you kill. That's how you maim and how you disappear. The way that you make people grow is that when they believe that they are capable of transformation. And so if you allow young people to actually express their genius and then see that genius and then see how that genius lands in other people, then they'll be like, oh, I can do better. And that's how you grow. Ah! I just mm -hmm. really am so frustrated because it's like, you know, in this moment, coronavirus, ugh, Oy. Hate her. Oy. when so many people are having to be trained at home rather than going to schools, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm tuning in to like what people are learning. And I'm like, is this education? Because I, I returned to that word that I brought up earlier, indoctrination, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't think that mainstream education is education. I think it's indoctrination that teaches people how to disappear themselves that teaches people how to wear a uniform. And so what I think that we need as creative educators is to not just say, what I'm doing is supplemental. What I'm doing is an after school hobby. What I'm doing is for the creative kids. No, what I'm doing is education. And I think there's a power to language that's so important to claim that is to say, we are educators when we are artists. artists Artistry is not just some class that you take in seventh grade with colored pencils. It needs to be there everywhere. And I think that the crisis of this moment is that I'm watching the news and I'm like, these people, they've lost touch with their artistry. You know, these politicians, they've lost touch with their artistry. They look at the world's problems. They don't know what to do. Artists look at the world's problems and we say, bring it on. I think the most dynamic people in the world are artists because they look at a problem and they see an invitation to experiment. Whereas a politician looks at a problem and sees it as an opportunity to profit. It's a different imagination. I just, I wanna encourage people who are watching to continue to praise and love and, <laughs> and express themselves in the comments because if you could see just now, Alok, just the, again, the magic that you are um, imparting on people and, and, and sharing about the Future Perfect Project workshops is, it, it means so much to me as a part of the organization to see how you as an educator um, have, are informed by the young people that you worked with with us and across the globe. And I, I just, on a little shameless plug, please follow the Future Perfect Project on Instagram or on Facebook. We're all around. See what I did there? Cute little segue. I live for um, her. <laughs> <laughs> always, always. Again, at the Future Perfect Project. If you're watching, um, please give us a follow. Um, you also say, and I think this really relates to what you're saying about sort of breaking, uh, the, like breaking the violence, right? The breaking that that pattern of existing. Um, you say that breaking the rules are just suggestions. Mm -hmm. I love that. I like live for that. You have me clutching my pearls because of that. Um, and I'm wondering if you like stepping into your teen self, like what does it mean? What does it look like to break the rules or to take the rules as suggestions? Yeah, you know, I, I think I would have had a different answer five years ago from what I have now. I think what I would have said five years ago is transgress. But even transgression concedes their ground. And mm. now what I'm realizing is their rules don't exist to me. <laughs> so there's nothing to transgress. Let me give you a metaphor. It's like, it's like being alive is a flowing river, you know? And a rule is a hand that is trying to grab the river. You're never going to be able to capture this darling because I was meant to be free, you know? And so rather than trying to escape from the crevices in their hands, 
I'm going to say 99.9% .9 of me is still in this damn river. So I'm going to keep on flowing. So you can try to take a little bit of this water, but it's going to fall and come right back where it belongs. And so now what I really am doing in my life now is very different than I think before is I was still trying to respond to, to critique, to engage the norm. You know, I, I was still trying to prove and convince and legitimize. And now I'm like, wait, all of my energy is trying to go into humanizing myself to people who are not human. I'm not interested in a machine saying that I'm human or not. <laughs> I'd rather find people, find people who loved me for me, not for my monotony. So what I really say when I say rules are suggestions is 99.9% .9 of what people are saying is projection. 99.9. .9. They will decorate that projection, girl. They will, they will make a graduation party for that projection. They will have a wedding ceremony. They will dress up with that projection. They will say, this projection is radical, political. It's like, baby, it's your projection. And now I have the power to extricate myself. And I never gave myself that permission because I think this is a profoundly queer and trans condition. We thought that other people liking us would make us safe. I thought, I, I thought that, you know? I thought that if I was like nice and like funny and supportive, <laughs> then people would defend me. But then they didn't freaking defend me. Mm -hmm. And so then I began to realize the only people who actually care about me are my community. So rather than trying to convince these people, like adopting their rules, so they'll mythologically, hypothetically show up for me, I'm going to show up for myself. And it's funny to me because I think when women and when trans people and queer people show up for ourselves, we get called bitches, we get called narcissists, we get called self-indulgent, we get called selfish. So I'm not trying to say that when you live a life beyond the parameters of theirs, that it's going to be easy. It's not easy. They're always going to try to drag you back into that hand. But what I am going to say is recant and say, that's a compliment. Thank you. I'd rather be selfish because I know who I am. You know, I'd rather have a self. And in this patriarchal, misogynist, heteronormative, gender binarist, trans misogynist world, I'm sorry that in order to have a relationship with myself, I had to spend some time on me. So I guess it's a long-winded way of saying to live a life outside of rules is to forget that the rules even exist. Like it's just, it's genuinely, when people are like shade, I'm like, <laughs> I, giggle, I giggle because I'm like, you're still there? Karen, you're still there? I'm over here. <laughs> I'm over here. It's like literally someone trying to invite you to a playground fight. And you're like, baby, I'm in high school, not elementary school, okay? Like, I am not gonna drive up to my elementary school just to spar with you. I'm, I'm not there anymore. And that feeling is so liberating. It is so liberating to understand these people hate me because I don't need them. Mm. Take me to church. Ooh. <laughs> yes. Oh, word. Word. Really word. And particularly about um, someone was just acknowledging in the comments that like self um, self partnership, right? That you're speaking mm -hmm. about. O M G. That you you talk about uh, transformation. You say transformation links the political, familial, personal, and intimate, and the cellular. I want you to tell me a little bit more about how that relates um, to what we're talking about in terms of breaking the rules, in terms of ecology and nature. What really does that, um, does transformation in that respect, um, how does that affect you in, from a day to day? Just because I love that you say the person that you are fr five days ago is different than the person you are right now. Because I can identify with like, girl, the way I was five minutes ago, the way I was an hour ago. Yikes. I mean, I'm like, <laughs> I am constantly in transition, right? Multiverse, right. whatever it takes. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that, that like, that constant change and how um, that has changed for you since you were a teen. Because I think a huge element of FPP Live is really us imparting um, a, a hope, right? A hope for, for, um, for those of us who are struggling, for those of us who are struggling to find community. And I'm wondering what kind of hope you would offer in transformation. You know, I... I want to say that I'm living my wildest dreams, but I didn't even allow myself to dream when I was younger. 
Mm. And so I never even had a future when I was younger. I was so stuck in the present. I couldn't imagine a future. And so I think my early 20s were me trying to be like, oops, I survived. <laughs> now what? You know, like I didn't think that I would make it this far. And now what? And so then I spent my 20s and 29 now being like, okay, now that I'm alive, um, what do I do with that, you know? <laughs> and how do I like, wh what do I actually, because you know, my goal, my goal growing up was like, get out, get out, survive, make it, okay, you do it. And then you're like, and now what? And that now what was terrifying because the only self narrative that I had was overcome. But now I had nothing to overcome. And so then I was just like, do I have worth? Do I have worth? Because the only way that I had worth was through struggling. And the only way that I knew myself was through conflict. And so I realized, yikes, that's not sustainable. I don't want to have conflict my entire life. <laughs> yikes, I want to be able to heal and chill and like, like eat like lettuce. I fucking love lettuce. And I want to just be like, I want to be like relaxed and like not have to like have some like traumatic arc to have worth, you know? And so then my body slowed me down. My body said, okay, baby. And then I was like, wait, what? So I went to all the doctors and they were like, all the blood tests are fine and all the scans are fine and everything's fine, but you're in pain. And I was like, why am I in pain? And then I started to think about that word cellular, you know, because they want to gaslight us and make it seem like, Racism, sexism, transphobia are things that are just in our head, but we bear the brunt in our bodies. And when you actually are no longer in that fighting zone, it's not like you're healed. It's like you have to confront the first 25 years when you didn't allow yourself to feel. And mm. so it hit me like a freaking ton of bricks because I was like, oh my God, I have all of this, all of this unprocessed stuff from when I was younger. And I finally have the space in my life to confront it. What do I do with that? And then I started to realize every part of violence, of trans misogyny, of the gender binary, of all that, it doesn't just affect me intellectually, it affects me cellularly. It turns my body against me. But then at the same time, if it can do that, imagine what magic and art can do. And so that was the second piece where I was like, I need to heal. I need to freaking heal. I need to make art that actually is honest, honest about, okay, I'm still in pain when I thought I wouldn't be. Inconvenient, oops, I thought that life would be better. It kind of isn't. And then I had to be honest because art is one of the only places we can be honest in a secular world. <laughs> so I had to be honest. And then what I started to realize is underneath the shame was where my spirituality lived. That in all over my body, I had shame here, I had shame here, I had shame here, I had shame here, I had shame here. And when I ripped off that shame, like a freaking bandage, it hurt like hell. But then I realized lurking beneath my shame was my spirituality. And once I found my spirituality, I was like, oh, oh, this is what it means to be alive. And I truly feel, I truly feel like I've only been alive for the past year of my life. I feel like I was existing, I was like doing, I was working, I was producing, I was succeeding, but I wasn't living. And now that I'm alive, I realize we live in the world of the walking dead. And all these people are out here pretending that they're alive. You would not say, go kill yourself if you were alive to some stranger on the internet. You would not vote for that for that dictate dictator dictator if if you were alive. Those are all latent forms of disassociation. Disassociation which allows someone else to author your own life. You are asleep at the wheel. And what being alive actually says is waking up and saying, I'm driving. Not only am I driving, but the sky, it's beautiful. Not only is the sky beautiful, there are birds there, which means I'm not alone, which means there are trees, which means I'm part of a larger world. Being alive is noticing the things that we have become numbed to. So I guess the reason that I have hope is because I transformed. 
I thought I wouldn't be alive and I am, is that in within one lifetime, I had many births, is that all of these things that tried to bring me down could not. So how could I not believe in the transformation of the world where at the cellular level I have transformed, then I believe at the global cosmological level we can transform. It's all interconnected. And so what I really am interested, I think, as a queer and trans artist is I'm, I'm kind of bored, I'm fatigued of critique. Like it's like critique is like, yeah, okay, cool, whatever, you know. But I'm so here for creation. And that's why queer arts matter. That's why the Future Perfect Project matters. You see that? Yeah. That's why everyone needs to follow the Future Perfect Project and support yeah. LGBTQ young people because we need irresistible creation right now. Because I watch the news, that's not created. I, I look at the political parties, I'm like, that, mm -hmm. that's not created. Mm -hmm. ah! And where I get my creativity is from the artists. And so what I ask everyone to do is, what if, what if we were to elect the artists? What if, what if we had the same due diligence we have to showing up for the political process, to showing up for our artists as well? What if we recognize that funding the artists was about changing the world? That requires a different world than the Trump administration defunding the National Endowment for the Arts when it came into power, because they'll look at our artistry and they'll say, what are you doing? But remember, why do we value the opinion of a machine? I'm not trying to be validated by a calculator or a weighing scale <laughs> or a camera. I'm trying to be validated by a heart. I'm trying to be validated by a spirit. And all those technologies are more interested in their fascist arithmetic, trying to make me into a sequence of numbers that Zuckerberg can sell you something to hate yourself with. I'm not interested in that. Louder for the people in the back. That's what I have to say. That's what I have to say about that. Oh my goodness. Alok, we have come to the end of our time together. How crazy is that? Oh my jizzle. Um, I am so grateful for your time. You taking the, the, um, the spirit space with us to really transcending with us at the Future Perfect Project and being a part of the Future Perfect Project to, to, for being a part of a more perfect future. You being you allows me, allows the other people who are watching today and the other LGBTQ plus teens who are struggling out there to find themselves and find permission to be themselves. I am utterly grateful for you and for your, your willingness and for that shout out, because that was really appreciated. Um, and so just to give you a sense of what's coming up, because I'm sure we're gonna end up having, interacting again soon, um, if it's not, through the Future Perfect Project, we're gonna have to kiki. Truth Bachman loves you and has told me just the most amazing things about you as well. Um, so Monday nights, we have our FPP Live at 7 p.m. We have Alona Verley, we have Peppermint, we have a Zach Barrick, we have an amazing lineup of people coming um, to talk, to have these kinds of conversations. So please again, follow the Future Perfect Project on Instagram on Tuesdays. And Fridays, we'll be having our FPOW workshops, which you've uh, worked on before, the FPOW um, writing workshop. And then on Fridays is our revisions. On Wednesdays and Thursdays, we'll begin having pro our WRQR, We're Queer radio program. The times are to be determined, uh, but there will also, get this, we're bringing on middle school programming. So we're gonna get the youngins even earlier so that they know and can be a part of the creation. And then on Saturdays, we're going to have these amazing workshops uh, with guest artists. And that's, I believe, I believe we do have a time for those. Um, no, we don't have time yet. Uh, or we do, and I'll make sure I get back to you. Um, <laughs> again, follow the Future Perfect Project at Instagram. Please follow Alok on Instagram as well. Support them in what they're doing uh, to make the world a more perfect place. And um, till next time, I'm so grateful for you and your generosity. I just... So much love, I feel a kinship, and um, I cannot wait to talk to you again soon. Thanks for having me, darling. Of course, See you later. Darling. Bye, love.